If you'd like to be involved with our children's ministry, please see Sheila Ibram. Talk with her. Uh, we always have places to help. And if you like, love kids the way we do, you see I hold one almost every service. If I'm here, I'm holding one. If I'm out there, I'm holding one, you know. But when I get a hand free, it's going in the air. John chapter 12. John the 12th chapter. Remember to love each other. Care for one another. If you know somebody's in the hospital, you can contact the office. But more than less, I uh, want you to go see them yourself. Also check on them. Check on one another. That's what the body of Christ does. You're part of the family of God. So make sure that you greet one another and love one another. I feel like I know some of you in here are real, real old. You know, I got, I got a mother and father-in-law both in their mid-80s, you know, so I understand that old. But uh, I'm 58. I'm not that old, but I got a lot of miles on me. You know, I put, I put uh, 4,000 miles on this body in three weeks, you know, on a motorcycle or a truck, and uh, been through storms and rainstorms, all kind of stuff. I'm getting to a place where uh, I wake up injured. Anybody woke up injured? You went to bed, you were fine. But when you woke up, your knee was hurting, your hip was hurting, your elbow was hurting. You know, I don't know what I did in the night or who did what to me, but I just woke up injured. I told that to my pastor on the way here. I was talking to him. He lives outside St. Louis, and he just started busting out on the phone. He said, man, you hit it right on the docks. You know, and he said, I go to bed at night, and he said, I'm fine. I wake up, and I'm hurting everywhere. I don't know what happened in the night, but I woke up injured. John chapter 12, are you comfortable? Over the next few weeks, we're going to discuss the passion of Christ. When I say passion, what I mean when you hear the passion of the Christ is this. His passion was the cross via the resurrection. Uh, everything about him was pushing him toward what was known in the Bible as his hour. He had a time, and he mentions it several times. Those he loved, the great pressures he endured for our destiny, it's important that we recognize the value of this Easter season. So we move toward it, the opportunity for new beginnings, the reality of the resurrection. And if there's something about res uh, Easter to me, it is new beginnings. It's that spring and all of those things, John 12, 20. And there were certain Greeks, and when I use the word Greek, let me just drop it in, Gentiles. In other words, if you weren't a Jew, you were a Gentile. So the Greeks were Gentiles. Came, uh, certain Greeks or Gentiles among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was at Beth Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him or asked of him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip comes and told Andrew. and Again, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Uh, let me just say something to you. There are times I know... In this church, the little country church, we, we've got about 700 active Sunday people, about right in there somewhere, six, 700 people. It, and then if you look at the scope of 30 years of being here, uh, there's, there's, over, there's several, probably several thousand that consider me their pastor. All right? So there comes a time when I can't reach everybody, just like Jesus did here. So Philip came to Peter. and well, look at it again. You'll see how it worked. It, 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 they came, Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew told Philip, tell Jesus, and so they kind of moved it down the line. There are times, don't get upset over that. Just, just kind of work with the system until we can get to you because I really love meeting with people and talking with them. But I, I just, I, I never want to be that church where you can't get hold of me. I just don't want to do that. I always want to be out front. I want to talk with you, see how you're doing. And Jesus answered him saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, no, no. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. When a voice, then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it sounded like thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was not for my benefit. It was for yours. The Message Bible in verse 20 says this. There were some Greeks in town 
who had come up to worship at the feast, they approached Philip, who was from Bethesda, in Galilee, sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. And Jesus answered. Jesus answered. And Jesus answered. Time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This morning I want to preach to you about time's up, that the hour has come. I posted yesterday that there's going to come a time in all of your life where time is up. And we live in such a way that it's not going to happen. And I will say it to every teenager, child, adult in this place. If you've got life now, you've got to live it. You've got to get in it. You've got to understand why you're here, the purpose of God. You've got to forgive deeply. You've got to, you've got to love with your whole heart. These are things that are important because time is up. I did a funeral of a 24-year-old boy this week who died of, uh, of electric shock. Uh, nobody expected that. I looked at, down in the coffin to him, his little burnt hands, and I, and I, I began to uh, grieve in my spirit about this is too young to go. I watched his young friends crawling over the coffin, his mother, and it hit me that there's going to come a time in all of our life that time is up. And when it's up, it's up. It's over. It's final. It's over. You don't get to come back. I mean, we try to do that, and we say it almost jokingly. We try to raise the dead. The truth of the matter is, as a rule, time will be up. For Christ, he looked for it. He saw it. It was his assignment to get to his hour. And then he tells us to do the same. Father, I ask you to bless, take this word, apply it to our heart. Let it be sobering. Let it be. I know, God, that times people laugh when I preach, and that's fine. But, God, let it be sobering today. Let us yeah, take a moment and realize just how important it is for us to real, live with destiny on our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You may be seated. This entire story happens on Palm Sunday, which would be what we would consider the days before uh, the, the resurrection. This represents the beginning to an end. It's a determined time. John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus said, the hour's come. Time's up. It's up. It's over. I've been saying this seven times does John make reference to the hour. John chapter 2, verse 4, in the beginning of the book, Jesus said unto this woman, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Speaking to, by the way, <laughs> that woman I think was his mother. Amen. In other words, he set his mom in place. Sometimes mama going to baby, she going to dope, she going to look over that baby boy. And at 33 years old, he backed off, at 30, uh, he backed off and said, Mama, it's time for you to realize who I really am. I am God's son. So, woman, what you, my hour is not yet come. John chapter 7, verse 30. By the way, he wasn't being disrespectful. He was just reminding her of her place. John 7, verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. Knowing that Jesus knew he would die, but he knew that they couldn't take him before the end. There is, a, there is an amazing, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Dis, uh, destructible, the opposite of destruction. Uh, no, uh, where you can't be destroyed. Indestructible feeling when you know that God has you and your time ain't yet. Are you hearing me? There's something about, I don't care if you're on an airplane or on a Harley or if you're riding a horse or wherever you're at, even if you're on a scaffold, if you climbed a 100-foot pole to change a light bulb and you know in your heart it ain't your time, it just does something to you. It doesn't make you, uh, uh, shouldn't make you uh, silly or, or uh, 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 yeah, careless. I'm losing my words this morning. That's part of sleeping. Uh, careless. Uh, but, but it makes you to a point where you're confident that I'm going to be able to move through this. I've driven through rainstorms, snowstorms, places like that, and I knew it. it's not my time yet. Amen. At least I don't think it's my time yet. I've often asked God, give me a heads up. Can I get an amen? Just give me, I don't care if it's, if it's 10 second heads up. Just give me a heads up before it's going to happen. That, that would make me feel a little bit better. Can I get an amen? Amen. John chapter 8, verse 20. These words spake Jesus into the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour has not yet come. John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, but for this I came into this hour. I came here for this hour. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. 
John chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son that, my, that, that thy Son also may glorify thee. That hour simply means a predetermined time, season, a place that you're walking in. You know it's close to the end. It was a culmination and a consummation of everything that he was to do. The hour was uh, was so in the earth it began to demand or to squeeze out a destiny it was a desirous request of the gentiles by the way the world's still asking for it today we would see jesus i would like to see jesus looks to me like you're living life in such a way that jesus don't matter to you i'm looking for somebody that, and so they went to the guys the disciples and said guys i don't know but it looks like you guys have been with him so i would like to see the man Jesus. I've heard about him. I want to see it. It came from these, these uh, Gentiles, if you would. They, they were not just Greeks. Again, Gentiles curious. They were Greeks at a, a, a Hebrew feast. They were Greeks on a mission, not just to see Jesus, but to interview him. They were Greeks that were tired of philosophy, tired of the Bible, tired of the news, tired of hearing everything else. We want to see him. I want to see a manifestation of it. They, they were Greeks unsatisfied with mere Hebrew religion. They want to meet a life changer. Somebody who has changed lives over and over and over again. They've not heard his stories. They want to meet him. Uh, they, there were other Greeks also we find in the Bible. At his birth, uh, about three years of age, we find men from the east that showed up. The woman at the well... She was asking for a crumb. She was a Gentile. Remember the demon-possessed man from Decapolis, amen, the ten Greek cities, also a, a Gentile. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, For the Jews require sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew a stumbling block. And I mean, oh, still today, to the Jews, Jesus is a stumbling block. They're still waiting on the Messiah. The blindness is amazing. And it almost sounds like I'm, put, I'm not putting them down. I'm saying they're blind, absolutely blind. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, 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 I'm, I'm for the Jews for Jesus. There's a lot of Jews that have converted to Christ. It, it's, it's taking place. But it takes a blindness to come off for them. They can't see it. He's a stumbling block to them. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Gentile, Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Their, display, their, their, their desire was displayed. The Jews were looking for a sign. It, uh, John, John 12, 9 says, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, which he had raised from the dead. I don't mind people coming for barbecue, for, for enjoying a meeting, for seeing a car, for seeing a sign. That's fine. But if they don't get introduced to Jesus, we missed it. If somebody hadn't told them about Christ, we missed the whole reason why we're doing what we're doing. Even in church or anywhere else that we're at, it's very important. The Greeks were looking for him. We want to see him. They wanted truth. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. They wanted something they had never found. I found that a lot of churches, and again, not trying to be mean toward churches, they have missed the mark by not displaying Jesus in the life of people, showing that Jesus can change a life. We had the joy this week of taking 85 kids and putting them off the tower and the swing. And I'm amazed when I get a chance to talk with them. And every time Woody would get up there and they get a little nervous, I'd say, well, you, do you know Jesus? Because if you don't, I wouldn't go off the swing unless I really knew Jesus. I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't slide down this 300, you know, is this going to break? I said, I don't know. It hasn't broke yet today. But do you know Jesus? Because that's, that's the big question here. Who the request came from, the Scripture says that, that it was brought to Philip. Philip is actually a, a Gentile, a Greek name. When people want to see Jesus, they usually find someone who can speak their language. That's why what you have gone through in life is so important, because you can talk their language. You know, Steve and Jamie run a, a, a skeet uh, uh, business, taking care of people that want, like to shoot skeet. That, that's this orange thing you shoot. You can't eat it, but it's fun to shoot. And, uh, but when I'm out there, there's, they talk guns. And if you don't know guns, you can't talk with these people. Everybody, when I'm around, Dennis, Dennis rebuilt his own car, his, his high school car, married his high school sweetheart. He just all into the whatever was in high school. Still got the same haircut hair, hair from high school. Still wears the same size clothes from high school. I mean, he's not changed. Matter of fact, Cheryl still wears the same size earrings she did in high school. <laughs> Speaking of all that, Dennis can talk cars with you all day long. Well, you got to, when people come to you, they want to know what it is you know. And then when you start talking, anything you know, I'm telling you, you can take this thing back around to Christ. 
It always can work back around. You use what you have. They, were, they went to Philip for a reason because they found somebody that could speak their language. And they used the word sir. Sir, we would see Jesus. If there's one thing every parent should at least attempt over and over again is to teach your children, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. The day of yeah and y'all, I, I can't tell you how many times I've corrected one of my kids that have used that word, and I said, what you, what'd you say? Oh, oh yes, sir. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Work on it. Because the issue is respecting and honoring positions. I, you may not even like that person, but I, I got to honor them. I can't remember one time I didn't get pulled over, I didn't use the word sir. I am a respecter of that position, especially when I'm in the position. Amen. I want them to know I, I respect. So, sir, we would see Jesus. They were speaking there to Philip. We, they were understanding the authority here and who was in control. It is interesting that Jesus' followers determined who was going to see him. It amazes me that Jesus' followers determined who was going to see him. In other words, they went through Philip and Andrew to get to Jesus. God is allowing people to go through you to introduce Jesus. They're looking at you first and saying, hey, I want to see Jesus. I see him in you. Will you introduce me to him? Because if he changed your life, I believe he can change my life. We decide today who's going to see him. It's a divine response. If Jesus said, if you want to see me, you got to die to yourself. Now, this, this is the heart of the message. John 12, 23. And Jesus answered him, saying, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. His perspective is how we saw, how he saw death, how he looked at it. As a matter of fact, look at it again. The hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He did not say die. He said glorify. Are you cold? You look cold. Are you going to be all right? It's a little cold, Ronnie. Help me out there, somebody. Amen. My bad. I looked over at Ken Rich, and I judged what, what, what the temperature should be. I forget. You, don't, you can't judge it off Ken. His vision of the hour, listen, positive. If you're a little chilly, that's going to keep you awake. Positive, powerful, victorious, glorified, which means to render or esteem glorious. Manifest excellence. You know what manifest excellence is? When somebody holds up the number 10 after you've done something. Amen. It's when you just created something nobody else has. That's manifest excellence. In other words, when Jesus was glorified, it don't get no better than that. You can't beat that. You can't get a ten and a half over that. Amen. He did everything right to the cross, through the cross, through the grave, into eternity. Manifest excellence. He glorified. He said, I came into this time to be glorified, to glorify the Father, that, that the Son of Man might be glorified. There's something about it. This song we sung at the end, that when we get to heaven, may we hear the words, uh, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the whole issue of being glorified. That when we get there, we realize that, that we weren't great. We were just good. And the only reason we were good was because of the grace of God. And the grace met us there, changed us, turned us around. Amen. The scripture even says precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of his saints. I, I, I can't get over that verse that God welcomes us home. That when we go, it's this transition from here to there. But it's parable here when he said, if you want to see me, you got to die to yourself. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Death is the key to spiritual fruitfulness. Apart from his death, his life stands in isolation with no power of increase. Had Jesus just died, uh, 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 excuse me, not to be mean, but, but, but of uh, old age, had Jesus just died in an accident on a chariot, it, it would have just stayed the way it was. But something about he pressed toward his hour. He did everything the Father told him to do. And then when he got there, he handled the cross with such dignity, amen, and death the same way. You know, before there's multiplication, there must be decomposition. I wrote some things here for you to catch hold of. Uh, again. Hello. The whole body or substance of the grain, except the germ, that which is inside, dies in the earth or is decomposed. And this decomposed substance constitutes the first nourishment of the tender germ, a nutrient wonderfully adapted to it and 
fit it to nourish it until it becomes vigorous enough to derive its support entirely from the ground. This is what ha- no, 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 go back, please. This is what happens here. Well, when you look at the, the, the corn, the wheat that goes in the ground, everything around it helped it. When it died to itself, it, it caused the germ. And then I'm, 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 I'm dwelling on this, this whole week, and I'm, I'm hitting this in my, I said, okay, God, but you're not talking about me dying physically. You're talking about me dying before my physical death. So what you're saying is that this flesh of mine, if I die to it, it'll make the germ or the spirit inside me come alive. So here's our problem. We don't like dying to flesh. I don't like giving up my will, what I like to do. I have, you know, we all have good lives. God's been blessed us. But the, and, and, and I told my pastor this morning, one of the things I got a revelation of is this word joy, that my joy is to do what he wants me to do. And I, I can't find any greater thing in life that when I please the Father, it brings me joy. Now, I look for happiness in other places. We all do. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We're always trying to get happy doing this, that, and the other. And it just keeps uh, our spirit soft and, 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 and little. But if I die to my flesh, if I say no to me and I say yes to him, and, and, I, and I love people, I forgive people, I care for people. I, I, in other words, I'm, it ain't about me no more. It's about my family. It's about those around me if I'm a, a assistance to them then now my spirit starts living and as I'm reading this I'm convicted of how little I've died to myself in 30 something years of serving God I mean I get going I have like this little mini revival in me I'm dying to myself I'm fasting I'm praying I'm giving and then boom the dead man comes back alive begins to take over again am I reaching anybody here Amen. It just begins to take over in my life again. I go, doggone, I'm just another backslid Baptist right now. That's the way I feel. Hey, God, help me to come back alive again. I need to fire up. I need, I need this time. This is what Easter does to me. It reminds me that I have to die to me. I have to give, because for this germ to live, for, for this, uh, everybody say germ. It makes it sound like you're you, you bad. You're a bad germ. You need to wash them germs off. Don't kiss her. You'll get germs. Quit playing in the commode. You'll get germs. In other words, the more I die to my desires, flesh, the more my spirit comes alive. This is why there's such a fight going on within us. And there'll always be that fight. It doesn't stop. It don't stop when you hit your mid-80s. It don't stop till you till they shut the lid on you. Amen. Just a day or so before it ends when, when it stops. But other than that, you're fighting this. So in this, God has shown his wisdom and goodness. No one could be more evidently fitted for another than this provision made in the grain itself for the future wants of the tender germ. Therefore, in order to live, we have to pass from ourselves. So when you understand this thought of dying to yourself... Now you understand why the Son of God recoiled, why he backed away from certain things that took place in his life. It, he, well, when I say recall, I'm talking about rattlesnake in front of you, you jump back. You know, you feel like something is fixing to be painful. Physically, he backed away from it. He, he, this, he, he actually used the term, should I drink the cup of suffering? Should I drink from this cup? And I've, I've preached a lot on the cup because I, I, I love the thought of the cup. Uh, he, he's, you know, he's already had or going to have. As a matter of fact, in ch- the next chapter, he will drink from the cup. He'll have the Passover. But before then, he's talking about this cup, the physical part, the scourging, the cross designed by wicked men, the spitting in his face, the mocking, the plucking of his beard, his back lacerated, his legs ripped open, uh, the, the, the mental part. He knew of Judas' betrayal. In Peter's denial. Let me throw something else at you. Do you realize he was naked on the cross? There's something about re- removing our clothes and it brings that shame, and, and, and yet we don't see that in Christ. But yet they removed his clothing. They beat him. I believe his blood covered his nakedness. Amen. It flowed over his body. It congealed like a, like a sheet, if you would, on him. Amen. His spittle mixed in with that. All the things that he went through going up to that. He knew the mental part. And then turn around to have Judas betray you. And then to have Peter deny you. All of these things in his mind. And then the spiritual, the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin. Oh, I'm ready to preach Easter right now. He who knew no sin became sin. Uh, All the sins of the world being put upon him. 
all of our, our grievances, all of our wickedness, all the meanness, all the evil that may never be discovered, God saw it and put it on him. When we said, forgive us our sins, amen, put the anguish of that which was old till new, all of this put on him at one time. Literally, it was the bitter, Josiah, it was the bitter bottom of the cup. Everybody here knows what the bottom of the cup is. Oh, if you ever drunk percolator coffee. Some of you, you're only going to know a Keurig your whole life. That's all you're ever going to know. But there was a day you put that coffee on the stove. And you put them grains in the top and the water in the bottom. And you watch that little clear cap perk. My daddy would sit there and watch that thing in the morning. It'd perk and perk. And when it quit perking, when that, water, when that coffee, it'd go clear, brown, and then it'd get real brown. And daddy knew his coffee was done. He grabbed that first cup. I've been a coffee drinker since I was a little boy. It ain't nothing like grabbing that pot and realizing that it's got a little bit lukewarm and it's almost empty, but you ain't had your first cup yet. And you pour that sauce over, I mean that coffee over inside that cup. You tip that cup up, you begin to drink it, and then you forget it was the last cup. And you hit the dregs in the bottom of that. Hey, I don't know why I even call it dregs. That's what I've brought up calling. Look, look, Google that. Find out what dregs mean. But you dredge you, you dredge up is what happened. You get that in your mouth. Next thing you know, you're looking for a place to spit. Because you swallow it, it's bitter. It's at the bottom, the bottom of the cup. He became sin for us. Stand with me. John 27, 12, 27. He actually says, but for this cause came I into this hour. I came, I came here for a reason. I've often felt in life that if I become more biblical in thinking that I was not born at Helen Keller Hospital in Tuscumbia, Alabama, but I was sent to Helen Keller Hospital in Tuscumbia, Alabama. They God sent me here. When you start realizing your life, you realize that God sent you here to make an impact, to find your purpose, to discover your destiny, and press into it. That you weren't just born, and it just wasn't just a date. It was a day that you entered. But you've always been a thought in the mind of God. That God thought of you before he sent you. He had to find a willing vessel. Somebody said, well, Pastor, I was a mistake. No, you weren't. God had to find a willing vessel. And God can take a mess and make it into a message, and that's who you are. Amen. I stand with three adopted kids, and don't tell me none of them are mistakes. I hug them little grandkids. Ain't none of them mistakes. Amen. I, I stand with them that God sent them into this world. And if I can change the way they think, then it'll change the way they live. Because you, 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 your belief affects your behavior. How you believe is how you're going to start behaving in life. So there's a, this, this setup that God brings us into. Jesus believed that he was sent to the earth to die for our sins. Did he shrug? Yes. Did he step back? Yes. So would you. You didn't want to do that. And yet he pressed into it. And by the time we get to Muscle Car Sunday, I'll be preaching on, uh, not my will, but thine be done. Thy kingdom come. Amen. What Jesus, how he took Matthew 6 and related it to Matthew 24. He walked out what he said. you got to find your cause before your time runs out. Sister Lori, put that first slide up that you had of the hourglass, please. That thing is running out in your life. Not that fast. But that thing's running out. My mom is a, has been her whole life that I remember, my whole life, an avid days of our lives watcher. I have never seen days of our lives but I have walked in enough times to hear as the day as as the hour as the sand falls through the hourglass y'all watched it so are the days of our lives and isn't it true I think that is that the show still going on that she's taping it I promise you my mama's DVR in that show Almost positive. She knows all of them. She's watched them all die. Here it is. Find your cause before the hourglass runs out. Find why you're here before the hour runs out. There's going to come a time that you'll hear the words. 
Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, cause came I unto this hour. Life is about preparing, but time's up. Time's going to be up someday. It's going to be over. Uh, I, I so want to die to my flesh and live to him. It's not just a sermon, my friend. This is a fight that we all fight with. We all struggle with this thing. We all deal with it. And if you don't, you don't know Jesus. You're just living for yourself. You're just doing your own thing. But if there's a tug inside of you, it says, okay, it's time for the flesh to die in the spirit. And I'm not telling you to give up anything other than what he tells you to give up. I just want you to find, he can go fishing. I've rode my Harley three days in a row. Today might make four. I'm just saying, when God puts his finger on something, say, all right, I feel you. I got you. I'll deal with that. And let your spirit come alive. Oh, man, when your spirit's alive, you just look better. You look thinner, <laughs> brighter, happier. You can tell when somebody's spirit's alive. Man, there's just something about them. But you can also tell when that flesh just keeps taking over. Well, no, you can't. They're not here when that happens. Okay. Oh, Lord, how do you end something like this? How do you do it? I mean, what do you got there? What you got? What song you got? That's not going to work. Join hands for the one next to you, if you would. Mm. Father, those watching on HolyWild.tv, we here at Little Country Church agree that this message was for us, that our flesh has to die in order for the Spirit to come alive. And one day we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That we've done everything you called us to do here. At least we attempted everything that we understood. We ask for a spirit of discovery. That you'd help us to discover our cause that we're here. For mothers to be mothers and fathers to be fathers. And husbands and wives to be couples. And for families, God, to grow stronger together. God, I give you praise for this house. I speak to the churches in this community that strength would flow back into them. That this community would begin to die to itself and live unto you. That, Jesus, you'd be the strong man in Crosby and Dayton and Channelview and Baytown and Huffman and all surrounding areas, God. We want you to be the strong man. We want you to rise. Lord, we want to win people to you. We want to share this joy that we've got. Lord, if there's one thing else I want to do, I want to be able to stand at the coffin of a believer, knowing that the corn is in the coffin, and as it goes into the ground, it's going to bring forth much fruit. God, let our lives matter here and in death in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God a glorious praise.